I'm Charlie Verin. I'm the ex chief scientist at the Institute of Marine Science, and I'm now working on a giant website which I hope will provide the information for future management of corals and coral reefs. One thing I'm, I've been curious about is uh, how you came to be called Charlie. Right. Uh, that was when I was six, and I used to take. Um, uh, bits of wildlife, dead wasps and spiders and things to school and my teacher used to call me Mr. Darwin as a nickname. I, he called, she called lots of kids something by the nickname. And uh, then I took a funnel web spider, a live funnel web spider to school and she was pretty upset about that, confiscated it. And then I took uh, later on a jar of polychaete worms. Um, and I'd forgotten to top the jar up with methylated spirits and I took the lid off, it stank like nothing. And she said, she said, um, uh, Charles Darwin, get that out of here. And uh, all the kids said, Charlie, Charlie. And so it stuck and it's been with me ever since. It's a nice name, friendly name, I like it. <laughs> but it's nice to be called after Darwin, but I don't think it's, the connection runs very deep at all. A lot of people make things of it, but I don't. So, so I'd be curious to know the journey you took to get to where you are now. How did you get into your field of research? Wow. <laughs> um, my journey is a very, very long and complicated one. Um, I'm, it's nothing like anybody else's. Um, I was a near dropout at school. I went to a, a Sydney private school and I was near the bottom of every class. I was very shy. Uh, asthmatic, got a stutter, could hardly speak, could hardly do anything and I hated school. I just loved the bush um, and um, I got the lowest possible pass at what was the leaving certificate, the end of, called it in those days. And I wanted to go to Hawkesbury Agricultural College and um, I needed a scholarship and with the minimum pass, it was one of the worst I think the worst pass of anyone in my class at school, my scholarship, that's for sure. And after a lot of heart soul searching, it was decided I'd repeat the year. And I, and I did. And I was given permission at the school to just spend my time in the library revising. I was exempt from all school activities. Uh, um, and I was exempt from biology, which is the one thing I, I did quite well in. And uh, I did the final year again. I got a first class honours in biology, the same in everything else, no scholarship. But at that time the, um, the government ha was running a exploratory um, second application cycle um, based on aptitude tests. And my father, um, I, I, we got a letter, didn't get a scholarship, but I could, go, I could go to an aptitude test. And my father badgered me into going and I did in a fortnight later another letter arrived, another lot of aptitude tests, this time it was a smaller lot of kids and I, I was really fed up with this, I'd failed the living certificate or near enough twice and, and all this. And, the th and then a third letter arrived and he practically had to drag me along but it wasn't an uh, aptitude test this time, it was just individual m with a group of people and I, I had a clue what it was all about and um, I remember very clearly um, uh, they said, well, you've got, uh, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, have I got a scholarship? And they said, yes, of course you've got a scholarship. That's not why you're here. Um, um, you're here because you're a gifted child. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> what am I supposed to be gifted at? And they said, cognitive reasoning. In fact, you've got the highest score in the state. And I said, what's cognitive reasoning? <laughs> they said, uh, people like you are usually very good at maths. And... Um, and actually got up from my chair, thanked them, said, this is a complete mistake. I've never passed a math exam in my life. And they said, yeah, we know. We've been talking to Barker College about you. <laughs> so I sat down in the chair again. And I got a scholarship through anything I wanted in a university as a, as a gifted child. And I wasn't a gifted child at all. It was, it was a mistake. But I went to Armadale to decided to do psychology to find out why I got the scholarship <laughs> and then I filled it in with other bits of science but uh, I couldn't finish my um, psychology because that was in the arts faculty but I went along to all the lectures and, um, and I did all sorts of things and I wound up doing um, 
studying um, animal behaviour because that was linked to psychology. And then I uh, needed a job. So I, got a, I did a, a master's degree on temperature regulation in lizards. And then I was decided to go off to the Amazon and live there. Uh, but I met um, this uh, lady who became my wife. And uh, it was, so I had to stay out at university and I studied temperature, uh, I studied um, colour change in dragonflies. I found dragonflies that co changed colour within half an hour and in, in the morning and to preserve their orientation to the sun. Yeah, you know, that turned out to be a dream PhD. Uh, just everything worked, but it didn't at first. And at first, then I, I, I saw an advertisement in a newspaper uh, that James Cook University in Townsville were offering uh, a, a postdoc, um, any expressions of interest. And I wrote back expressing interest because my PhD at that time was just falling apart. But I'd taken up scuba diving as a hobby. And, um, and uh, then this, the PhD worked fine. Uh, I won a prize. I was offered uh, four postdocs immediately. And I accepted one to go to Canada to study uh, the migratory locust, the endocrine system of migratory locust. But, I, but then uh, uh, James Cook University sent, um, sent me a letter saying um, I was offering a, a postdoc there. And I wrote back to them saying, thank you, but no, thank you. I, I, I'm not interested anymore. Um, uh, but I, the, the, the corals that we found at the solitary islands off Coffs Harbour, that niggled away because I wanted to, we wanted to put together some sort of project that would turn that place into a marine park. I thought it was really a fantastic place. It is a marine park now, it was only 30 years late, but anyhow. Um, I went to the library to f see if I could find something to identify the corals I collected. I knew nothing about marine life. I'd never been to a lecture on anything to do with marine science in my life, never have. I've given lots, but I haven't never uh, attended any. Anyhow, um, so I went to the library and there was Isabel Bennett's book on the Great Barrier Reef. And I was summing through that to find out something about corals and there wasn't much help. Um, but then I thought, hey, slum further, all these beautiful places, and, you know, uh, these, uh, it's just a pitch, pretty picture book about the Great Barrier Reef. Why am I turning down a scholarship to do anything in this place and going to Canada? So that night I scribbled two more letters, one to Canada saying, uh, sorry, but change your mind, no thanks, and one of the other to James Cook University saying, yes, please. And uh, it turned out I was the only person that um, applied for it. I didn't apply for it. I, I was the only person that expressed even interest in it. Because no one in those days was a scuba diver. You had to be a scuba diver. That was the condition. And so I, I went to um, James Cook University to do something about corals. I didn't know anything about corals. But I spent two years exploring the Great Barrier Reef. And um, the, uh, the first director of Ames turned up and the vice chancellor threw a welcome party and um, lots of VIPs were there and, and I was there and I don't like VIPs and I drank a lot of wine as anaesthetic and um, apparently I behaved fairly badly and the director was uh, the, the first director Red Gill Martin he liked he'd heard about wild Australians and he thought he had met one <laughs> and he offered me a job the next morning when I still had a hell of a hangover on the basis that of my bad behavior <laughs> <laughs> and only later he found out that I actually was studying corals. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's how bizarre the whole story is. And I've been, uh, I was there for I think, 32 years, I think. But I was the first scientist of Ames, the first full-time researcher on the Great Barrier Reef, I mean, on anything. Um, and um, I was the chief scientist at Ames for about half its existence. Um, but really, it's all... I've never applied for a job in my life. I've never applied for a promotion in my life. Um, it's all, it all happened by other people, it all happened serendipity. So the first scientific mystery you ever investigated was yourself. Did you ever that, solve that mystery? Uh, no, no. Um, you'd think that someone who got a scholarship that I did would be a very bright person. I am, am not a very bright person. I've got a very good memory, and I've got a so I remember stuff about marine life or any other life and identify things. And I've got this passionate love of nature. And I think if you really have a passionate love of anything, you remember lots about it. I mean, if you if you love cars, you remember all the details of cars. I I've, I've loved nature, and 
It's my memory that's um, all I've ever done in my life was observe and write about it. And so I've written uh, something like a hundred publications and that's including 13 books and, man and, and monographs. I, um, it's, it's because I, I love the, the marine life, I love coral reefs. And so I remember all this stuff, and it's not just about taxonomy, it's about everything to do with marine life. Um, uh, and I love, and that's why I was chief scientist, I love, I love joining one science with another. And so um, I was a bit slow on the uptake about climate change. And um, I, it started to worry me uh, more and more. And I started reading about climate change and more and more and thinking, you know, this is going to affect coral reefs really seriously, and, uh, and ocean acidification. And, and that really was reading other people's work that um, got me interested in the whole thing. And uh, at that time, I was having one of the many fights I'd had with directors of AIMS. I was always having fights about with directors. I always have had, I hate bureaucrats. And, um, anyhow, um, um, the plan was to... Um, uh, that we'd take all my long service leave and I'd, I'd have a, uh, a half-time job that we, as a family, would go to France where my children could learn a foreign language and get exp my young children and we would get some experience in, in, in a foreign country. And we spent a year and a half in France and um, that's when I wrote A Reef in Time. I took hundreds upon hundreds of references, uh, great crates of references, and I had no other responsibilities at all. I just had, I was just a writer and reader and I read 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 just absolutely everything to do with it. And when I finished reading, um, Harvard University said, oh wow, yes, I want, we want to publish this. And um, they did, but they, dumbed, they had me dumb it down to an extent which I didn't really like because it was a much more technical volume than the one that was actually published in the end. But maybe they were right if it was if, they hadn't, if I hadn't dumbed it down, um, they, it probably wouldn't have had the, the very wide... Uh, it was published very, very widely. It's had, it's had a, quite a big impact, and that was why I wound up in the Royal Society with David Attenborough next to me, um, hours on end, and, um, and why a lot of things happened. Um, so although uh, I guess I'd call myself a coral specialist or coral reef specialist, um, I got into climate change because it worried me so much. And so it traces the, the origins of the Great Barrier Reef from, the, from their very, very beginnings. Um, I disagree with all the geologists in, in, their, in their drillings. I was at cross swords with them, always have, because uh, I know they got it wrong. And, have, um, and I went on to past climates and how climate change has affected coral reefs throughout the geological history, and then on to modern issues with ocean acidification as well as climate change and mass bleaching. But none of this was um, original research. It was, all, um, it was all a synthesis of what other people had found. Um, I think the original book had something like 2,000 references to it. Now, I should have kept that and I should have put that on a website somewhere or something like that. But the Harvard University Press said, you've got to keep it right down, dumb it down, make it a small volume. And if, um, and if um, the author of A Brief History in Time doesn't mention that E equals MC squared, you're not to put in a chemical formula about ocean acidification, keep equations out. So I did. And um, it's a book that's become, became very widely read. And um, especially on the subject of ocean acidification, I think, because it was the first time that the um, experts in the field of ocean chemistry uh, were exposed to the, the broader issues, which were mostly to do with coral reefs or ecosystems of, of high latitudes, and, uh, but especially about coral reefs. And I met, later on, met the best of the ocean acidification chemists and so on, and they they had a mindset that ocean acidification was their subject, was about ocean chemistry. Well, it is their subject, but there's a huge amount of uh, much bigger subject. And um, when I first met, I won't say his name, but I first met 
One, there's a real expert, the most, the best, the, the, the guy that knows most about ocean acidification. I met him at a workshop and he said, he um, was over breakfast and he said, Charlie, I read your book and I, I, oh, I, I just thought, oh, I, I want to talk to you about it. I thought, oh God, well, I've got, well, I've got something wrong. And then he went, went away and it was the following day. He said, look, your book, I just read it and I spent all night reading it and I read it again the next morning because I never realized ocean acidification was that subject, that bigger subject. And of course, um, um, he was the expert on the details. And um, I, I connected that up with a big, big picture. Mm -hmm. And a big, big picture it is. And, and it's, it's a gloomy one, but I have to say, um, it's not a subject I enjoy, <laughs> of course. I guess um, the challenge for science communicators is straddling that line between capturing all the technical details and making it simple enough for a broad audience. Well, that's it. That's one of the things. Um, and really, if you're going to talk to a big audience, a general audience, um, you've got to put on a different hat because a scientist, well, at least most scientists, have in their, in their mind, they don't think it through, but they're actually talking to other scientists and they're, and they're being happy that they've explained it in a way that can't be really criticised. Uh, other scientists can't really come back on them. Um, but the real communicators um, push the detail away and use snappy catchphrases. Uh, although they may not be scientifically spot on, they engage the public. And if you're going to talk in a public environment, um, f a whole assemblage of facts are not going to work for a big audience. Uh, what works is um, emotional content, uh, is the big one, and that's something that I've learnt. So a lot of scientists are really not good at talking about their subject, even though they think they are. They're not getting out to the general public, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of scientists They've got their science right, they've got their wording right. Uh, I listen to them and think, that was a great talk, but most people wouldn't because it's dry, it's factual. And um, the fate of our planet is not explained in dry, factual ways that reach the general audience. The best talks I've ever given of, uh, of when, as I say, I've, I've, I've always given interviews where it hasn't been recorded. I, Oh, I thought the, the, the camera wasn't running and I got, I got upset about the whole subject. Or in other times I've seen someone smirking in the audience and I actually turn on the person. And sometimes, once in Townsville I just slammed the computer down and ramped and raved, pacing up and down the floor. Uh, <laughs> so that went down well. A lot of people remember that talk very well. Whereas if I'd given a cold, dry, factual, even chucked in jokes, but uh, it's hard to do that on that subject, but um, uh, it's a message that comes from the heart is what works. And the last workshop I went to was some time ago now on, uh, on climate change. Um, I thought, oh well, you know, here's another talk about the effects of climate change on coral reefs. It wasn't mentioned. I wasn't even asked to mention coral reefs. It was all about communications and networking and getting communications onto, over to experts. And I thought I was an expert, and I wasn't, I found out. You know, you, you, the experts are the people that, that um, don't try to win the argument just by factual information. Um, that doesn't work. And I think um, we need to think about uh, why religions work when, when, <laughs> when facts don't. <laughs> Well, things like that, but um, there are some things which don't work for a general audience and some things which do. But Australia's pretty much behind the ball now. Um, Australia's way, Australia and America are the two worst countries I've ever spoken in about climate change. The least accepting, anywhere in Europe now, climate change is just, it's very rare for anything to come up which is a denial or not acceptance. In America, you have this, it's all religion driven. In Australia, I think it's just plain bloody ignorance. And it's, it's, you'd have to be just ignorant to 
to push some of the things that have been pushed, although I think this is history now. I hope so. So when you wrote your book, was, was part of it in response to some of the misunderstandings and misinformation about coral Oh yeah, reefs? absolutely. Mm. And uh, yes, it definitely was. It was partly me um, wanting to follow up um, uh, a lot of different sorts of sciences and put them together, but the, uh, the, it was largely driven by getting annoyed with things I saw on television especially a couple of geologists who really annoyed me. And, um, but uh, there were so many false statements made and I want to do my part to at least get factual information out. I am a scientist. I, I love factual information. Although I sometimes speak in, a, in, a, in an emotive way, in my head I love facts. I, I'm, I don't care about opinions. I like facts and fact information. Climate change is so solidly based in fact. And it was and has been for a very long time, long before I, it came to my realisation. Um, so I came in pretty late in the piece, actually. Um, it, was, you know, it was this century, really. So in the 1990s, yeah, I'd read about this and that, and I sort of think, is this all that right? Because the facts were never clear to me. And I had to go back and read absolutely everything, and I did. Um, and then it really consolidated into something. And as it consolidated, it made me more and more uh, aware, in fact, angry at, at people who deny science. Um, it, that makes me angry because I think they should just shut up. By all means, disagree with science. That's fine. Debate it. That's fine. Yeah, engage in a debate, but stop this this um, farcical um, um, mismanagement of science, cherry-picking, saying things out of ego, out of attention-seeking, because they've got no other means of getting recognised, that sort of thing. So I think these people are the enemies of the future of my children. They're degrading life for all humanity. Uh, you've mentioned a few times, uh, I guess, your, the evolution of your, um, I guess, uh, understanding of of climate change. Uh, like you said uh, once that um, you thought the oceans were limitless and that the natural environment was oh, yes. indestructible. Mm. So, so how did you get from that point? Like, was, it, was there a particular thing that, or was it a gradual accumulation of information that, that shifted that view? Um, I think um, that the, the oceans, the notion that the oceans were indestructible, I think almost anybody my age, if they're honest about it, has gone through that phase. Um, and I certainly did. I thought, all right, we do all these things in, on land, but we can't, we can't harm the oceans that way. And it was only when I started, when I, I, I read about what we've done to um, wild stocks of um, uh, fish, of uh, food species for humans, and then when I saw, I started to see the destruction of reefs and that really turned me on. Um, I've worked on every major coral reef region in the world now with very few exceptions. And that's a lot, that's 66 expeditions, that's um, 6,000 hours of scuba diving and on working on corals, not, not playing. And um, I've come back to the same place uh, sometimes 20 years later and I've seen this drastic deterioration in coral reefs. And I found out that it wasn't just limited to coral reefs. And so um, it's, it gradually built up on me. Um, um, I think the thing that really turned me on was working in Asia. Um, uh, in the 1980s, um, the Great Barrier Reef, I didn't think it changed very much. Um, but I'd gone back to the same spots in, in uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, wherever, and uh, found that there'd been a huge change. And I also found uh, later on there are no big fish left anywhere in Asia. They're just gone. There's no sharks. You can even die for them. Yeah, a, I can be with fish people on a trip for a month and we haven't seen a one single shark. Now, um, so, uh, but that was... I guess in, 
it wasn't until the early 1980s that I really got alarmed about what was happening to coral reefs, and then I realised it was happening to oceans everywhere. Um, obviously, the, uh, the cod story of the Atlantic and so on. Um, and I knew about what happened to uh, the, uh, the prawn industry in the Gulf and, and so on, one industry after another. And so, um, but I, I never studied, I guess if I'd ever been to a lecture on marine science, I'd have done better, but I never, marine science was never part of my education. Um, and uh, so it was a pathway of discovering it all for myself, mm, rather than being taught it. Right, seeing, seeing environments change before your eyes over well, decades. Well, absolutely, and I've been doing that for decades now, and you know, a lot of people say, what a fabulous job you've had, you know, you've dived all over the world, and you're incredibly well-traveled, you've seen all this and you've done all that. Um, yeah, it was once a fabulous job, now it's horrible, because I go back to the same spot, and it's just nothing like it used to be. And so, um, what was, um, I'd say, the best job in the world is not now <laughs> even a nice job. It's, it's a very unhappy job, mm -hmm. and it's made me, um, I, I have to say it, it's, it's, I've, had a mild, I've been mildly depressed um, for a long time now. It's a depression, because it's not, it's not only about coral reefs, it's about the future of my children. And, um, and so... I live science, I believe in science, I see facts, I like to understand facts, and when those facts continually tell me that things are seriously changing, and they're changing so rapidly. Now that bit about rapidly is, is one of the cruxes of it all, because of all people, one thing, one thing I do have a good handle on is time, because I've got a good geological knowledge, uh, all the way to a good genetic knowledge, because I've been in both fields and everything in between. And so I, two of my books have got the word time in their title. Time is, a, is of an essence to, in my way of thinking. And what we are doing to the oceans, to the planet now, we're doing it at an absolutely explosive rate that has never been seen on this planet before. I guess the only thing parallel is when the asteroid hit the Earth at the KT mass extinction. But um, I can't see a grain of evidence to tell me that we are not launching into the sixth mass extinction. There's never been an increase in carbon dioxide like we've seen. I guess that asteroid would have done the same thing. It's not the amount of carbon dioxide, it's the rate at which it's building up. And for so much of the animal life in the oceans, they're not genetically equipped to accommodate such rapid change. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, adaptation. Well, adaptation means evolutionary change, it's a genetic change. And corals and, uh, and, and so many other organisms are no more likely to adapt um, than humans are. Uh, humans in a hundred years time, they'll still be humans of today, just born a hundred years later. Um, and corals have even got a longer life cycle, and a lot of them have. They're not going to be given the time to adapt, yeah, sure, if, we, if the carbon dioxide that we're predicting now um, took a thousand years or a hundred thousand years, perhaps, yeah, sure, this has happened before and it can happen again. But it's not happening in a century and that's, uh, that's unprecedented by a, an order of magnitude, at least. And so we're not going to have an a adaptation, we're going to have sheer destruction. And that's what I believe, and I, as, a as a lover of the natural world, that I find that just unendably depressing. Um, if they're going to be, in, be involved in, in, in a debate on this subject, at least that debate needs to be controlled. Um, and I think the, the media have done a really bad job in Australia uh, by saying, oh, we've got to have the, uh, the other side now, even though the ratio of disbelievers to believers is, is well, 95, 99 to 1. And I think um, it, we, we're coming through that now. But it's held the Australian public in the doubt for so long. And I think that's a terrible thing to do. It's so important. There can't be any greater, can't be a subject of greater importance than this. And uh, to have um, um, compromised the future of our children, let alone coral reefs, is a terrible thing. You mentioned the sixth mass extinction that you think is happening now. Can you tell me more about the 
previous five mass extinctions and what drove them? Yes, well, um, I've always had a big interest in this subject. And um, so I have um, seen what happened as, in as much detail as possible during mass extinction events. Now, for a start, they're called mass extinctions events, but they're actually not events. So, um, there's been five of them, and all except when the asteroid hit the Earth 65 million years ago, um, they have taken over a million years to happen. Um, so they're not events, they're, they're, they're collapses. Um, perhaps the end of the Paleo... Oh, these are so... These are events that are, these are happenings that are so deeply embedded in our in the fossil record they've been known since the 19th century, and so this it, they're really blindingly obvious. The end of the Paleozoic was the biggest one, where almost all life on this planet was snuffed out. Um, then, but then you have to look for a cause, and so I've written, I've published this. Um, you can delete one thing after and after, after, after another. But the one you can't delete is ocean acidification. That's something that's big enough to, to do the job. You can discount everything else. But if, if you're going to have something that can drive uh, masses of extinctions in the ocean, the oceans come first, and coral reefs always come first, then ocean acidification is almost the only guy left standing. And then when I published that, that got a, a bit of um, adverse response until specialists in, the, in, the, in that area have changed their thinking. And um, I think that's become a quite a, um, I don't know, widely accepted view because not many people go into it, but it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a radical view anymore that ocean acidification has been the prime driver of, of mass extinctions. And it really makes sense. Um, ocean acidification will affect carbonate platforms, the coral reefs of this world. It will affect carbonates that are used in animal life, backbones or whatever, um, not just corals. Um, and it affects aragonitic organisms before I everything else. Um, now, something like a third of all marine species have some part of their life cycle in coral reefs. It's a huge proportion. And so when coral reefs go down, it's not just the extinction of corals, that's almost trivial in this, in, in this thing. It's, it's the entire ecosystem goes down and, and takes with it, it'll take with it a third of all marine species. And that's, and that's extinction, that is complete extinction. And so um, after each of the mass extinctions, there's been a lag time between coral reefs being able to come back again of three, five, six, ten million years because the whole ecosystem, the whole animal life has to re-evolve. Re and after the, Paleoz the end Paleozoic mass extinction, um, all corals went absolutely entirely extinct. And the corals we have today are not related to any Paleozoic corals. They're a completely different order of animals. Um, and so, uh, if you change the conditions of the ocean that, to wipe out um, um, ecosystems that depend on, on carbonates, the chemistry of carbonates, when you wipe that out, you bring down the, you bring down the oceans. And you directly bring down uh, this very high proportion of species because they've got a part of their life cycling and, uh, in coral reefs, but when you do that, of course, that, the, the flow on is to all other species anyhow. And um, I think the, uh, what's happened in all the mass extinctions, except one, um, one's not clear at all, the mid-Devonian extinction, um, that had a, a plunge in carbon dioxide, but that could be that could bring about the end result, the same result, but that's a, that's a debatable one. I think the other five are not debatable at all. It, it, it's, it, it's a dead clear thing. Um, there's nothing else that could drive a mass extinction, except so, perhaps some incredible virus that affected all life. That's the only other thing, and that's so unlikely. So when um, corals experienced mass extinction, they recovered 
uh, there was a process of re-evolution, not repopulation? Um, no. After mass extinction, you've got to have re-evolution. Um, so after the uh, end Paleozoic mass extinction, um, a whole new order evolved, and they're called corals. Um, uh, in the middle of the Mesozoic, another mass extinction, um, almost all corals went entirely extinct, and whole new families of corals evolved. At the end of the, the KT, the, the, the end of the Mesozoic, uh, again, uh, most Mesozoic uh, families went extinct, totally gone. Uh, and uh, there was nothing, coral reefs vanished from the face of the earth. And it was just, some of them did survive that, ex that mass, some families did ex survive that mass extinction, but most didn't. And those that re-evolved, a cropper is the, is the champion of this, a cropper um, came back in, in force. And a cropper is a real habitat builder. It provides protection for so many other, and that's, so that's when the, that's when small reef fishes really evolved. If you went b b before that, that mass extinction, corals were mostly massive things. They didn't form such complex protective habitats. And you didn't have this diversity of fish. Now you do, because of, because of reefs, because of acropora, and the other branching corals, but mostly because of acropora. And so there's, a, there's, there's such a logical good link up between one thing and another. Um, just what will happen by the end of this century, of course, is we've got a long way to go, but at the rate at which we are increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the oceans, um, it is firstly, it's, it is absolutely ridiculous to talk about um, adaptation because um, nothing except microbes or very small, or, or organisms that have like Drosophila have a very, very short life cycle. Yes, yeah, sure, they might adapt over 100 years, not corals. No, I'm afraid. In a few generations, I don't think so. They eventually will change the uh, the zooxanthellae um, to a more temperature-resistant zooxanthellae. They can do that, but that's again that's an, that's a that's a um, that's a very slow process. It's not going to happen in 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 that in that very short amount of time. Unfortunately, by the end of this century, at the rate we're going, we're going to have absolutely lethal conditions for coral reefs. Um, and again, again, I think you've got to think outside the box to appreciate that because it is true that corals will tolerate a much um, uh, lower pH than is predicted. Uh, you can, the corals will survive um, in conditions that, which are mimicking the end of this century, but they're not growing. And there's certainly the larvae when they settle and they put down that first little tiny, it's transparent plate, which is, the, which is where a larva starts to form a coral. Um, they're not going to do that. They're not going to be able to do that. Um, we have already passed the level of carbon dioxide that um, uh, corals have evolved to, to, uh, to accept and use. Um, we're already past that. The ocean acidification that will follow now is a hell of a lag time, but, um, uh, we're, we're, but the level of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere now um, will produce um, a saturation state which will prevent larvae from forming spat, the very initial growth thing. Yeah, they won't, it won't affect the big colonies anything like as much. They're, they have almost a chemical shield. They, they control their own chemistry between the skeleton and the living tissue. That's true. Um, that, it'll be the last thing to go. But their reproductive cycle will be blown to hell. The oceans uh, absorb about half of the CO2 that we emit through fossil fuel burning. Mm. Is there any limit to how much the ocean can absorb? Well, yes, CO2? it is. Um, the, um, over time, over, uh, given enough time, the oceans can absorb anything that can be thrown at them in, in, in the way of acid. There's not enough acid on the planet to seriously change the pH of the oceans. Um, if every bit of acid there was wound up in the oceans, but it, it, 
what what that's assuming that the ocean um, is mixed in to deep water where ocean carbonates can absorb all the acid there is but you're talking about a circulation time a circulation pattern in hundreds and hundreds and if not thousands of years so it's, it is again a question of time and there isn't enough time for the oceans to um, chemically cleanse themselves as it were um, in time to to support carbonate um, platforms on the surface. Now this has happened at least 30 times in fossil record. At least 30 times. And every time you go into it, um, the finger is pointed at acidification. It's creating an environment where coral reefs just snuff it out. 30 times in the fossil record over 34, what time period? 34 I think is, 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 is a reasonable estimate. Uh, over what time period? Is That's the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. Mm, of Sterotinian corals. Um. And so um, they run on a boom to bust cycle and the, the boom cycle is, is when we have uh, low uh, levels of carbon dioxide and where the sea level is constant or not continually destroying these. The bust times are when sea level fluctuates and the, the alkalinity of the oceans fluctuates down, pH goes down. And so it's those two factors which create the boom to bust cycles which coral reefs have always had. Mm. Mm. So you could say that uh, the present situation um, is, it's not a coral problem, it's a human problem um, uh, if we don't drive the corals to complete extinction. Uh, but it's, it's certainly a human problem. There are people, young people alive today that will need to watch um, coral reefs on, 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 on a modern video, on, on, on the video of their time to see a, a, a coral reef. And I will say that now there's almost, we've almost reached a time when you can't find uh, pristine coral reefs anywhere. There are some patches left here and there, but uh, I've traveled so much and seen so much before the real impacts were happening that I find incredibly sad that I am probably the only human who will ever live who have seen coral reefs in good state because I've traveled all this, all, all, all over the world and, uh, and even if there's someone who, who um, is in a position to do that and to study corals, they're not there to study. Coral reefs will never, coral reefs don't look like they, they, they do when I, when I, was, when I was young. I found that it's just in my lifetime. The change in my lifetime is horrific. And it really is. That's what drives me, uh, firstly, to talk to you, uh, but then to write about these things. And to um, uh, we're producing a giant website which will track this. Um, it's, 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 it's one of the most horrific things happening on our planet. So your website, this is Corals of the World? Yes. Could you tell me about, um, about what that website's about and what you're trying to achieve? I wanted to, I've written books about corals of here and there and wherever. Um, and, but what, if, what we did was effectively created a global taxonomy of corals. And once you've got a global taxonomy of corals, then you can map, you've got global maps of corals. And that started to emerge, um, in the late 1990s. And so we decided to produce a, a, a book, Corals of the World. And um, that was a pretty big undertaking because, um, um, yeah, I, I had no problem getting a publisher. But that book would have sold for $600 a copy. And I, I don't want to write a book for wealthy Americans or Germans or whatever. I want to write for people who actually use it. Um, so we published, we built it and published it ourselves, the whole lot. Um, uh, Ames paid the, the printing price, the most expensive book ever pub uh, printed in Australia, um, and, um, but they got their money back and made a profit on it actually. So um, that was fine for year 2000. That was 15 years ago. Um, over that, because from the cutoff point we stopped taking new information, it was 1998 or 1997, because it took two or three years to build the book. Um, and so um, I might have thought, well, it needs a, 
another corals of the world, but I thought, hang on, we've moved on, Technolo the technology's all changed, um, and it's changed in a way that website now can do everything the book can do. And so um, I've got a very computer literate wife, and uh, we got our heads together, and we mapped out, we could build a website which would be everything the book is, uh, brought up to date. Well, now the website is 10 times what the book is. It's huge, and it's got every record of every coral in the whole world in it. And you can ask very sophisticated questions of it. I've had a hell of a time trying to get funding for it because we can't just build something out of nothing. But um, hopefully we'll get an um, initial test version going by the end of this year. It's taken seven years of... Um, of um, without me not having any income, which is not so good for our family, but um, it's, uh, it's something that will be available free to every human being on this earth, and it will answer very sophisticated questions. Uh, the initial one would, is, is primarily about uh, identifying corals, their taxonomy, what they look like, thousands of photos, uh, and then um, a mapping program which has gone far beyond anything I ever envisaged because the actual website builds the map according to what the user asks or wants. You tell it you want this map, uh, maps of these corals in this place, and, and then it'll give you the statistics about it. In fact, if you, can write an, if you know how to write a, an algorithm in Excel, the website can read it and give you the results. Um, so it's a very, very sophisticated website indeed. Um, and uh, we started off, we found the best uh, web builder in the country, um, to do this, and it was only a month ago that, the, um, that they decided they'd scrap the whole thing that they've done and start again on another platform. There are technical reasons for this, and they're doing it for nothing at their own, because they just love this, this website. And that's, I'm talking about um, maybe a, a person year of work, um, of, of um, uh, computer programming and the designs and so on. So it's, it's a huge, huge job, much bigger than the building of the book. It dwarfs the billing of the book. I thought websites would be much easier. No, they're much harder. Apart from the fact that you've got to have everything exactly right for a website, otherwise something goes wrong. But um, the, of course the beauty of it is that it's available free to absolutely everybody. If you're a, a, a poor student in Vietnam or Indonesia or wherever, you've got exactly the same access as an American billionaire. Um, so uh, that for me is absolutely critical and the other parts is parts are that it can be updated and then we want to bolt onto it um, we call them modules of things like the connectivity of, of, of reef regions so if something happens there what are the consequences there or where do you put marine parks now I've had a big say in where marine parks go all marine parks virtually in, in the Indo-Pacific um, this will actually, when we get the final thing going, we'll have a, an expert system where you can ask almost any conceivable question, and it will give you an answer based on the based on the best science there is. And um, I want to do that before I die, <laughs> because I think it's so important. Uh, for me, it's the absolute goal. It's the it's the best thing I can do to help coral reefs through the times ahead. Um, so it will identify corals that really we need to think about keeping in aquaria, just the same as a rare mammal might be kept in a zoo. Um, this will happen, and we will need to do this, and we'll need to go into coral gardening. We need, we'll need to have special areas for particular purposes. Um, this is going to happen, and I, I, I don't know how clever the technology of management is going to be in the future. In other words, if something goes seriously wrong in one place, can we, can we make amends in another place? And things like that. Um, but this website will provide instant answers. Uh, so it would give an answer to something that would take a PhD, uh, the time of a PhD, to work out from scratch. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands and thousands of references. Then combine them all on all these different subjects. And so it's got a way to go before it's got that sort of power, but that's our goal. And so 
our goal will be to vi combine the biology of corals with the physical environment in, 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 in absolutely the, the maximum scientific depth and to provide direct answers to anybody's question for nothing. And, and I have to say, this is incredibly well supported by scientists um, and other people. We've got something like over 90 people have given me all their photographs of corals. And these are the best photographers in the world who are among these. Uh, or loads of unpublished data. Um, um, so if someone has mapped something rather or has data about something rather, be it crown of thorns or bleaching or temperature or certification, whatever. Um, it's been given freely because this website is free for everyone. And that spirit of that has, has caught on and gone everywhere. And um, I find that very heartwarming. Um, and I think when this thing is finally, when the initial version is released, it'll be a cut down version because we can't afford to do it full on. Um, when that um, cut down version is released and people see the power of this website, um, then I think uh, maybe I'll finally get a grant that will pay for the rest of it. Um, and yeah, then also when this happens, we want to bring in more expertise. So uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a physical oceanographer, I'm not a chemist, and nor of any of our team have skills in these areas. But we want to have a chemist. We want to have the best chemist. We want to have the best oceanographers. And we want to have the best of this. And, and to, to combine, to say their job is to produce this block of information, which we, can, we know how to bolt that onto our website as overlays. It's going to have thousands of layers. And you're going to be able to drill down from your home. You're going to be able to drill down through that to get answers to the yeah just about any question you might want to dream up. And I, I, I find that as a an all um, keeps me going that car, that that goal. And um, I think it will happen. It sounds like the kind of project that would um, make a good partnership with someone like Google. Well, it was in a partnership with Google. Um, Google said, wow, um, um, yeah, um, but that was when uh, Google Earth was, uh, was floated as a public company. Before that, they were just funded the whole thing. Um, as it was, they said, we can't, it's a public company, we can't fund it anymore, but we've got a little bit of spare change, that's $50,000, that would keep us alive. Ames pulled out of it because it was too expensive, too difficult. Um, but Google said, hang on, we, we, we can give you 50000 to keep going. And Dave Hannon, who runs a, an NGO, said he did the same. Um, so they, they were lifesavers, and other, others now have chipped in. But um, actually, the amount of money we need to do the job is absolutely trivial mm -hmm. compared with most research projects. What we need from now on, though, is expertise in these different fields. And... Um, I can confidently say that we know how to, um, to build on in Google style. And maybe Google will take it back, but Google keeps changing their maps, so we don't like that. Hmm. But, um, um, but in, that, in that style, and so, yeah, you will be able to Google that website. It, Google might take it over. I don't know. But somebody, I don't care. I just want that information to be available to absolutely everybody, free, with no strings attached. And so people will give to us free to use as we want. And um, that's happening. And, I, um, and so I, I'll, have it never, I'll never have it um, with, um, for sale, for funding to be attached to it. I want it to be usable by a little school kid, by anybody. And I believe that's going to happen. That's my swan song. I'll be exhausted by the time that's through. <laughs> I guess the big question is when will that initial launch be? Well, um, I think by the end of this year, um, we will have it out to be tested. Now, um, because it's, it is a very complicated website, it's got search boxes and it's got three search boxes of different things. So it is, um, it's been difficult to design, but when you actually see it, you think, oh, what's difficult about that? It's all very straightforward. It'll look straightforward, but it isn't. Um, and so uh, by the end of this year, we hope to have it out to people who will try and break it. <laughs> they will try and st stop it, uh, find fault with it, 
and also people who will want to look at it from a, from a strictly user's point of view. Um, initially, all I know is coral people who will, who, will, who will get stuck into it, but we want to have it stuck in it. We want people from different fields um, to try to see um, if something can be done in a smarter way. And so we'll go through, a, I think early next year, we'll go through a rethink of fine-tuning to get, to get as clever as we possibly can. And then we will release it, and then I hope that um, we can build on these final modules and attract other authors of the whole thing to do the final. Um, we've done, I think, the hard yard, um, and it is now fairly straightforward. I've uh, thought that before and been wrong, but I do think it's fairly straightforward to finish this whole thing. So it's a real expert system, and it will, it will achieve every goal we've ever dreamed of. Um, I hope so. But, uh, you know, that's what I believe, and, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a pretty rough road to get to the point we have um, with virtually almost no significant funding at all. Because um, no one's believed us until... Well, people have believed us, and they say, oh, we can find money for that. But when that goes up to the CEO, uh, who has to sign something, he said, website? Um, isn't that Australian government job? Isn't that we deal with Pacific, or we deal with the Caribbean? Or um, There's always that sort of question. It's always a, uh, a square peg in a round hole. But when it's the initial releases come, it'll, it'll, it'll sell itself. It'll be obvious what it is, and there'll be no doubts about it. Now, as you talk about, as a scientist, and you've come to understand the realities of climate change, and, and it's quite depressing thinking about that. I think that uh, hearing you talk about this project, it, uh, I think possibly the, the best way to respond to it is to find a way to, to make the best, uh, the most impact we can, and, and I think that's a lesson for all scientists. Well, it's certainly my hope and um, my source of joy in the whole thing. Otherwise, I might as well just go and jump off a cliff, you know. Um, I think the, uh, this is my, my, my hope that um, I can make a difference and that other people, it will empower other people to make a difference. And I think they will make a difference and I think um, this will take corals and reefs through the nastiest time, the nasty times that lie ahead in the smartest possible way. And um, it will, I think we'll definitely do that. And if there's, it'll make my life worthwhile, put it that way. Well, I think you've made a lot of contributions to science that, that you've already um, you know, certainly had a, a worthwhile uh, contributions to our scientific understanding of coral reefs. And well, this will be the big one. This will really be the big one. It will dwarf everything else I've ever been involved in. And it's so great that technology is, and this technology wasn't available 10, even 10, 10 years ago. And um, this, the technology has now become available and we can use all these, all these clever ways of doing things. And we can, we're going to build onto this. We're going to be able to build on video and, and all sorts of things, mm -hmm. educational modules. Um, we're going to be able to do things which we only dreamt of. Only 10 years ago would have been impossible. Now we've got um, the power of the internet and of computers, um, the, the, uh, the rate at which um, the server of this website can compile through this, this masses of data almost instantly and come up with uh, an answer is incredible. And um, of course, it's only going to get better and better and better. So we've got a way to go, though. There's some things you can't, for example, go to sea out of internet range and still use the website. So we've got We've got to produce something that you can put on your laptop when you go to seas. It won't be the full shebang because that has to be mapped, have to be built by, by the website itself because that's, they, it, 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 it builds maps out of just data sheets. Um, not maps, just data sheets. But we need to have it so that um, when you go to sea and you want to find out about coral or you want information, you, you want a subset um, that, will, that you can take with you on your laptop and that you can update when you get back and say, update this, and away it goes and update it. Um, so, but you want to be able to use it at sea, away from the internet. Um, so that's, a, that's a, you now there's all sorts of challenges. Mm -hmm. So it's, these are technological challenges. 
Um, and the way, as you know, the IT industry is moving, uh, the answers will be there as quickly as can be. I think 10 years' time, this is going to fly everywhere. Yeah. Moving forward, um, from a scientific research point of view, what do you think are the most exciting questions about coral re research uh, at the moment? I think the, um, there are some really big unknowns. Um, I think that ocean acidification um, is a, we're, we're only at a broad brush stage. Um, we know general things. Uh, we know what corals can tolerate, what they can't, but there are all sorts of... Um, we haven't honed that down to the details that matter. Often the devil is in the detail. And as far as ocean acidification is concerned, I think that's a big, big field that is, is still very much um, neglected. And I think we need to have um, uh, a lot of science on, on not just... a semi-applied science, but we need to get into um, an area where we really know about a lot of these really scientific details. Um, we, we've, people are working on, on, on things which will um, make a difference. It's almost applied science, which we need that also. But uh, I think uh, marine science is still in its infancy. Um, and I think the students of today, which are well, the people that matter, um, the students of today uh, are going to be able to get really good projects together to make a hell of a difference uh, in the future. Now, the likes of me and the website and so on, we're just regurgitating known information. We, the website doesn't create new information, it puts, puts it together in a new and in clever ways, but we need to always think about uh, getting the, um, the base information together. Now, if you think of something like medicine, um, medicine's been around for as long as humans have, since witch doctors have. Um, medicine is still in its infancy, isn't it? I mean, it's still. So we've got to look, we've got to keep into the into the science that matters, and that's basic science, the really, to the, the discoveries that make, um, are the building blocks of, of a bigger picture. And so my advice to young people today is think about, is to keep thinking, um, thinking, not just reading, not just assimilating what other people have thought, but thinking, shutting yourself away, shut the computer, um, sit on a boat, dang your toes in the water and think what really, what really looks like being important. That's, that's all I've done in my lifetime. And, and, and think, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we knew that? And there's so many questions. Um, I think marine science is one of the most critical of all sciences because our oceans are the ones that are, are, are so under threat. And I say, oceans will bring about a mass extinction. We've got to take care of them. The oceans are the big guys. And uh, we've got to look after it. And um, I just think we're just beginning, just dabbling. Um, and I just love the way so many students today, I love hearing about their projects. Half of it I can't understand. I'm not good enough at their field. But a lot of it I can. And I think, Gee, good on you, because that's, that's, it might seem an obscure, narrow little bit of stuff, but it's really important. And um, so I just hope that countries like Australia, where marine science should be the big one, uh, we're, so we get, we've got our coastline, we're set up for marine science, uh, universities have got to drive this, and it's not going to be done by governments. It's not going to be. It's going to be done by young people doing smart things, and they've got to be free to do smart things, not to do what they're supposed to do, not do projects that are given to them, not do them to get points for publishing papers in journals and things. They've got to be able to be free to think, to do, um, to think outside the envelope. Um, and I just love to see students that have got 
that are really keen, uh, love their subject and are, are really enthusiastic about it, that's what's going to drive the future. That's what's going to come to the rescue of the planet. I think it's just absolutely fundamental. And um, it's going to be, um, I hope I can stay um, with it long enough to appreciate uh, the, some of the discoveries that are, that are coming in now. Um, and who knows, there might be, um, with, there might be smart ways of, of coming to the rescue of corals, of the oceans. Um, we've got to hope so. Mm. Mm. One last question. Um, could you, um, could you summarise, I guess, in a short statement, uh, about hu how human activity has influenced climate change and, and the oceans? particularly from, from the point of view of your research? Well, I think um, human activity is, is, is an absolute one-off. There's no precedent in the geological record, and it's partly the, the, it's partly the destruction caused by so many humans. And coral reefs occur in the tropical world, and so do most uh, uh, countries which have got very high population pressures. And so... Uh, I see this everywhere. Population pressure is a very big thing. <clears throat> so that's one thing. And, of course, humans, first time ever in, in, in the history of the Earth, are actually changing our, our very environment in which everything lives. So humans are, um, are, are inflicting incredible damage on our planet, and it's going to get very much worse very quickly. And I think we're drastically underestimating the speed of th this is going to happen. There are, there are young people, and I'm afraid my children are included in it, which are going to see this world in a, in a horrifically bad state. And I think that's terribly sad, um, but I think humans have done it. We're not nice to our planet. The other planet would be a lot better off without us. Mm. Um, what happens after humans have done their thing? Will, you, will there be humans around? To, uh, will there be a completely differently organised critters? Well, they won't be doing the same thing as they're doing now. They'll be completely different. And I think um, in a hundred years' time, we will see a very, very different Earth. Whether it's got humans on it or not, I haven't got a clue. But they will be, be, their numbers will be very different and their behaviour will be radically different than humans are today. We're talking to Charlie Varun. 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 Varun, yeah. Well, that's not a good start to an interview when I mispronounce. As, as you know. we're here.